The Human Target, issue number three. That's right, folks. After recently reviewing a less than stellar Tom King book, it's nice to jump into the land of something he's actually good at writing. And, oh, man, was this issue fun. So we'll get into it a bit more here. I got a lot of words to say about the way Tom King portrays some characters. But before that, I just want to briefly mention the cover art for these books because... It's the best cover art on store shelves right now for any comic book. I will stand by that because it is just so perfect and silly and campy and just like old school posters for noir and espionage and just weird stuff. I love it. This one in particular, I I don't know where the homage is coming from. To me, it reminds me of like old school like food adverts where you're just seeing people over the top eating weird stuff i got for some reason and it makes no sense i got lard lad vibes from booster on the cover here i know that's not the inspiration but that's what i that's just where my mind went so i love these covers i i'm buying every issue i there's few books i buy physically and digitally i'm buying the physical copies for each issue because i think when this is all done i want to get like a nice frame with all 12 issues and just put them up on a shelf or just put them on display somewhere where it just looks fantastic because they're so gorgeous, and I just adore everything about them. So we open up the book. Christopher Chance is passed out, and he's just thinking about his time with ice when they kissed in the water. And somebody's at his door, and he's like, Hey, Chance, it's time to get up. And we see, sitting at the edge of his bed, is none other than Guy Gardner. And this kind of brings into the first topic I want to talk about with this issue. And this book in general, actually. It's amazing how good Tom King can get these characters when it's not Batman, because he really gets every character here. And again, there is narration from Christopher Chance throughout every single panel and every issue. I'm not going to get into detail on those, because it's not important. Basically, Guy's here for a reason. He's like, okay, so I heard you were talking to my girl. She's like, well, it's not your girl. So first off, stop with that. You see that Chris fires a gun hoping just to distract him and guy blocks the shot he's like you shouldn't have done that guy now they're getting ready to fight you, you see like both these guys are literally just on edge they're getting ready to beat each other up it's like you don't control her so maybe don't come into my room and start yelling at me to tell her to get away from what i'm doing she's a, an independent woman she can do what she wants and you just see Guy's acting like an asshole because he is. He's just screaming and swearing at this guy. And you just see Christopher goes to throw a punch. It gets blocked by Guy. And he just makes a bunch of constructs of fish just beating the crap out of him. And he gets knocked unconscious and he just leaves the room. And later he wakes up and who's standing over him? None other than Ice. So, it's perfect. It's silly. And again, because we are doing like the noir story, the detective figuring out who's plotting the murder, who's doing what to kill the client... Guy has to fill the role of the arrogant asshole who's like, stay away from my girl. Kind of the role of like the petty ex-husband or the petty lover in a story like this. That makes sense to me. When you are taking the JLI and doing this kind of a story with them, that is where you would put Guy Gardner. I do like the idea of putting Ice in this, in this role. It does kind of fall into the classic Tom King trap of... The woman is either used as an object to make the men look a certain way without having any agency, or the woman is so propped up on this one thing that she overshines every other character, and it doesn't matter what she does, she will always come out on top. I don't know what direction this one's going yet. Like, I think you could read into this book that Ice was the one that killed, tried to kill Lex. I think you could look at it that way. I, the book hasn't implied that yet. But that's so obvious, and, and King could do obvious, but I, I don't know if that's the obvious he'd go for. I don't know, it's a weird mix. But they wake up, and you just see they're getting ready to do their next meeting. You see that Luigi, the guy, he's, like, he's staying at his place, and he's like, I, I get me one of those rings, I'd beat the crap out of that guy. Foreshadowing, we'll come back to that in a bit here. And we see that they're headed off to their next meeting. They're going to be meeting somebody important as they're driving down the street. Who shows up in a green car? None other than Guy Gardner. And again, just talking about Greg Smallwood's art, it's perfectly great. I love the way he draws the constructs because it's just a green car. It's just the outline of where you'd see the detail on it. It's a green car. And he's just acting like an asshole. He's like, this guy bothering you, babe. You should hop in here with me and get out of here. And she's like, Guy, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, this is, this is so annoying. And you see, 
in a beautiful scene. Christopher is just letting them talk over each other. The light's still red. He's getting ready to go. He's like putting it in gear. He's revving up his engine. He's ready to drive off. He just slowly pulls forward. And because of that, the guy thinks, okay, step on the gas and let's go. And as he pulls out, a truck comes in and hits Guy's car. And you just see Ice look back like, man, you sure know what you're doing. He's like, I don't know what you think. I don't know what you mean by that. I'm just driving. It's great. I think it's great. So, guys, temporarily out of the picture. But where are we going today? Well, we're going to the grand opening of Booster's Bagels. Again, for some reason, I, I don't understand it. But for some reason, Tom King gets how to do Booster Gold. I don't understand it. So, pretty much, like... I, I think the way when Christopher's like narrating how he feels about Booster, it's kind of like how Tom King feels about Booster and like the JSA and all of them and all these characters for some reason. He's just kind of like, Booster's an idiot. Like he's literally a joke. He's dumb. He's silly. He's nothing. But they're all kind of dumb. Every costumed hero, every vigilante, every hero, they're all kind of dumb. At least Booster is a joke and he's a funny one. Kind of just like, yeah, it's silly, but he's a self-aware kind of silly, so it works. I think that's right. It's weird to me, you know, like for some reason he really gets Booster Gold and I think that works perfectly. So they're at the opening of Booster's Bagels, you know, him and Skeets are in an argument. He's like, you should use scissors to cut through. He's like, no, don't worry. I'll just use my laser. It's like, you do that, you're going to break something. Of course he breaks the window, but he's like to Skeets, you know, if I use scissors, that'd probably happen too. He's like, yeah, probably actually. So they just start talking they go inside they start talking boosters trying to like kind of like play up the idea of like the noir detective master of disguise come to talk to him. He's like how do i know you're really christopher chance like boom what are you up to boy works for him it's like booster did you try to kill lex luther three days ago he's like hmm no i didn't and he, he's like do you know where i was three days ago he's like well skeets can verify for me he's like in the 19th century england trying to get working what is he trying to get keats to help write the bagel menu and we see like a flashback to where he's been traveling lately. And Booster's been through all these different time periods, getting like the right seeds and onions and everything perfectly what he needs to make his bagel shop work. Because, you know, the bagel game is like this high cutthroat business and it's, it's a hard thing to get into. You need it to be perfect. He goes on this weird tangent about like pre-toasting bagels as if that is something you do. It's like, what does that even mean? How do you pre-toast a bagel? It's a weird thing to bring up, but it's like, that's Booster, just completely dumb and misreading every situation, but it's not misreading it in the way that Guy Gardner misreads it. It's misreading in the way, like, we're in a bagel shop, so I'm going to tell you about my bagels. I didn't do it, and you're trying to figure out who's killing you? It's not me. And if your name is Human Target, I don't know if that's true or not, but maybe you should be looking at the other picture. Then we get some narration as kind of like the conversation wraps up. You see, like... Christopher's looking at the relationship between Booster and Ice is like, well, they were more than friends. They were a family on the Justice League. You see all these heroes working together. And all of them, they were kind of just like this group of people that would show up and fight crime. But these guys were tight. They would laugh together. They'd enjoy their, each other's company. They were more than colleagues. They were a family. And it's like, you see Ice kind of bring up this idea. Is like, so you think it's something to do with the water? He's like, yeah. So Booster might have had access to the water in Lex's place, but he didn't kill anyone and basically because lex would have some weird scans for his food if people showed up he'd be like if somebody used like an out-of-date hydrogen and oxygen to make a cocktail that would fool those scans that would leave booster as a percent potential suspect but it's like do you really think booster would do that i actually think he pre-toasted the bagel something that you literally cannot do he is not that smart <laughs> he doesn't have the capabilities to do that it's like, maybe, but there's only a couple people that know the trade secret with the water. It's like him, it's Skeets, and their silent partner. And you see Ice is like, well, I don't know who the silent partner is, but I had to guess it might be his best friend billionaire, Ted Cord. But we don't see Ted Cord in this book, so we'll come up later, and we see, like, I guess we're going to be headed there to figure out what Ted's going to do. But before they get to the car, Guy shows up again, totaled the machine, it's like, what, he broke my car, I break his car. It's only fair game, kiddo. And this is where, again, Chris stands back and lets Ice do her thing. Literally just using her powers to unleash hell on Guy Gardner. And again, the, I get it. I get why Tom King wants to write this book. I really do. Like, it's just, 
Ice is a character I'm sure a lot of people have a special place in their hearts for. You're not doing anything with her anyways. Here you go. Make her the femme fatale in a book like this. It works really well. I think it's cool. So guy fixes the car. They're going to go get some dinner somewhere. They just head out. Anything but a bagel. A nice little end to that story. They're driving down. It's nighttime now. And he's dropping her off at her place. And you just see he's like, all right, say goodnight. Drive away. Don't let anything else happen. And then he's like, well, I guess I could walk you to the door. So he walks her to the door. They're lingering on the moment again. It's building up the tension. And you think to yourself, like, okay, they're... They're building up this idea that Christopher wants to bang Ice, and I'm sure she wants to as well. There could be that their way, but she she's kind of more focused on clearing Fire's name, because I still think she's prime suspect here. Interesting stuff. Really interesting stuff. And it's just like, well, glad I can meet your expectations, Mr. Chance, and closes the door before they actually commit to the idea of the two of them sleeping together. Good. Because we've seen other Tom King books... He's not good at doing, like, the actual romantic stuff. I think just having the tension between the two is better instead of, like, actually building into it. So he goes back to his drink. He's going back to his place. He's having a drink. Who walks in again? None other than Guy Gardner being an asshole. He's like, you know what, dude? I'm sick of your shit. Just get out of here. He kind of, like, whips up a little bit of stuff to attack. Chris takes him out of the room. He's like, Guy, what are you doing to this? And you see in the sky that coming down is none other than Hal Jordan. He's like, Guy, what the hell is wrong with you? If you're going to act like this, there's going to be some consequences. So if you're going to be an asshole, I'm going to need the ring back. And I might take it away forever unless you stop being an asshole. So Guy gives up his ring. He gives it to Hal. You just see Chris gets up and punches him. He's like, can I keep the ring? I don't care. Booster won't miss it. And you're like, Booster, what does what you mean? That? What does Booster have to do with this ring? And then we see in a beautiful, this is it. Like, this is what you do to end this issue. It's perfect. You just see Hal Jordan was never actually there. It's Luigi in disguise as Hal Jordan using one of Booster's rings to pretend to fly and taking Guy Gardner's Green Lantern ring, the thing he wanted to use to beat up Guy to begin with. And you just see it's like, hey, can I keep the ring? It's like, I don't care, Luigi. I don't give a shit. Keep it. Great ending. A great, just quiet ending to this fun issue. I like it. I, I think the last issue was better just because it's playing with like the femme fatale theme, which I enjoy seeing. But man, if Tom King just he just gets how to do this story, like the asshole boyfriend antagonist, the the schlucky guy who's kind of like wanting to put himself into the story but never actually getting there. You know, it's like the silly stuff with Booster and Guy. Like it works so well. It's just great, and this is exactly how a superhero noir should go. Just playing with the tropes perfectly, and especially on a big scope like this. I love it, and I also love that we're three issues in, and we're holding off. We are holding off on the reveal of Batman. Very strong stuff. Greg Smallwood's art is so good. It's so gorgeous. The best stuff you ever looked at. You should buy this book for the artwork alone. The writing is strong, but it is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. I would put this book on my top 10 of 2021, but it's only two, three issues out by the time of this, so I probably 2022 you're going to see this book on a lot of top 10 lists so good it is so good so the human target issue number three i'm going to give a nine out of ten thank you guys for watching this review be sure to like and subscribe to the channel as always you can check me out on instagram tiktok and twitter i will catch you in the next one have fun stay safe good luck